ladies and gentlemen, it's been quite a year for Australia and the world. At home, we've seen, again, catastrophic flooding up and down the coast. A new government has taken office in Canberra. Australia lost its long-serving, long-distance head of state in Queen Elizabeth II. In our region, we witnessed, we've witnessed the expansion of Chinese influence into the Pacific. Japan's longest serving Prime Minister Shinzo Abe was assassinated. The brutal regime in Myanmar continues its campaign of repression against its own citizens and also against one of our citizens, Sean Turnell, a friend of, uh, a friend of mine and a friend of many of us here at the Institute who's been convicted on false charges for supposedly violating the Official Secrets Act. In truth, as anybody who knows Sean knows, his only crime was trying to improve the lives of Myanmar's people. And at a personal level, I would like to thank those Australian journalists who've maintained a focus on Sean, as well as on the other Australians detained in China and elsewhere. In Europe, of course, we've seen the unjustified and brutal invasion by Russia, a nuclear weapons power and a permanent member of the Security Council of its sovereign neighbour, Ukraine, in the largest land war in Europe since 1945. Uh, one of my highlights this year was being blacklisted by the Russian state for saying mean things about Vladimir Putin in June. My only regret was that I was only listed at number 33 on the list of uh, the Australian blacklist. I think I, I looked at some of the names above me and I, I don't want to get into detail, but I think I deserve to be a bit higher. Um, we hosted uh, uh, President Zelensky in, um, in October and uh, part of my agenda for trying to get Zelensky was that I thought that the Russians might retabulate the ladder and I could move up a little bit further, but so far no updating. So it's been, it has been a big year. Um, one of the, the features of the Media Award is that each year we've invited a prominent individual to speak about um, these questions of Australian coverage of the world, of events, of how the media is changing. And over the years, we've had some fabulous speakers, including um, Brett Stevens of The New York Times, Susan Glasser of The New Yorker, um, Nick Warner, who was the head of the Australian Secret Intelligence Service, but whose father, Dennis, Glover, uh, Dennis Warner, I should say, was a... Um, was a storied war correspondent, as well as Malcolm Turnbull when Malcolm was um, communications minister. So um, tonight, to that role of honour, I'm delighted to add my friend Gideon Rackman. Gideon is the chief foreign affairs columnist for the Financial Times, a post he's held since 2006. He joined the FT after 15 years at The Economist, which included spells as a foreign correspondent in Brussels, Washington DC and Bangkok. He's also the author of several books, including Easternization, War and Peace in the Asian Century, and this year, The Age of the Strong Man. Gideon, I don't know if you've been blacklisted by the Russian state. You have? Excellent. Gideon, what, what number were you? Oh, Kath, Kath is all, okay. So, so th there's a lot of comrades, a lot of fellow travelers here, here tonight. Um, so he's been blacklisted. On top of being blacklisted and being brilliant, Gideon is also very funny. Um, and I think all in all, he's the perfect media lecturer. So can you please join me in welcoming Gideon Rackman? So, uh... Thank you very much, Michael, for the introduction, for inviting me out to Australia again. I keep turning up. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I'm slightly worried that you've said I'm very funny because I actually don't think there are any jokes in here, but <laughs> I'll, I'll do my best. Um, so it's great to be uh, at, at a ceremony that's you know, rewarding foreign correspondence. It's how I started and I've now moved into the slightly gentler uh, era of, of commentary. But like many people in this room, I suspect I... When I first wanted to be a journalist, I actually wanted, above all, to be a foreign correspondent. It was the glamour job. It still is in many ways. And uh, I remember sitting on the shelves of my parents' house was a book called Point of Departure, which was the memoirs of a man who was the great foreign correspondent of his day, the 1950s, James Cameron. And that book's just dust jacket referred to him as probably the most experienced and certainly the most widely traveled writer in the world. And that seemed to be something to aspire to. And by the Vietnam era, then there's a new generation of kind of glamour foreign correspondents who were a bit more kind of rock and roll. There was 
than James Cameron. There was Michael Hur's dispatches, which uh, placed the kind of hard living writers and photographers, I think some of them Australian actually, covering the Vietnam War right at the center of his narrative. And there was a book that you know, caught my imagination as a teenager and, and that of many other school kids, dreaming of one day becoming a foreign correspondent. So by the early 1980s, I was at university and made a trip to Israel during the 1982 Lebanon War. And there I actually met some real foreign correspondents. I remember at a kind of memorable party uh, in Jerusalem. And I had a long conversation with one of them, a guy called David Blundy from the Sunday Times, who looked like a foreign correspondent out of central casting. He's you know, tall, good looking, just back from the front line. He was also actually, though, very generous in spirit. And we had a long conversation. And I remember discussing Michael Hur's dispatches with him and David remarking, I think correctly, that he wasn't totally comfortable with the way that Hur had made the journalists, the heroes of the book, the center of the book, because we are, in the end, observers. We're writing about other people, not ourselves. So a few years later, I was lucky enough to become Blundy's colleague. He was the Washington bureau chief for a new newspaper, The Sunday Correspondent. I was working alongside him in the Washington office. But the story does not have a happy ending because uh, David always found Washington a bit dull. And one week, just a couple of months after the paper was launched, he decided to go down to El Salvador to cover the war there. And just a few hours after arriving, he went to report on the fighting and he was shot and killed by a sniper. And David's death you know, serves as a reminder, which I've always kept with me, that being a foreign correspondent can also be a dangerous and a deadly business. And of course, many of the postings are not remotely dangerous. I spent five happy years in Brussels, which is not, <laughs> I think, a posting that David Blundy would have particularly enjoyed, although it's one I found genuinely fascinating. So there's different forms of foreign correspondenting. But it is true that some of the most dramatic and important foreign stories involve wars, and they're, rus they're risky to cover. Um, Many years after David's death, one of his close friends from his Sunday time years, years Marie Colvin, was also killed covering the war in Syria. And as we uh, meet here in, in comfort in Sydney, as we were reminded, some of the people who are up for awards tonight are in Ukraine, which is obviously a risky environment. Covering wars isn't just dangerous, though. It's also expensive, certainly if you try to take the right precautions. And that brings me to a key topic, which is the future of foreign reporting and there are two particular challenges that I'd like to discuss. The first is the near collapse of the business model of much of the Western media and the threat that they'll be unable to continue to fund foreign reporting in the way they once did. And the second is the rise of social media and what that means for how the news is being reported and the traditional authority gained or otherwise of the foreign correspondent. So as The Economist Southeast Asia correspondent in 1992, which was the first time I was actually a staff correspondent rather than a freelancer, and I was astonished and delighted to inherit a penthouse flat, a cook, a driver. Um, admittedly, my predecessor had ideas above his station and was, had actually gone on to become an investment banker because I think, <laughs> uh, but he had set up arrangements that I happily inherited. And the Economist's arrangements were not notably extravagant. The American newspapers seemed to have even more money. I remember the LA Times correspondent in Singapore telling me that it was actually written into his contract that he and his family would always fly everywhere first class. <laughs> and he described to me the great satisfaction he had in entering first class cabins with his two tiny children and seeing the horror of the other uh, people who'd paid for their exclusivity. But those days are gone. Uh, I don't actually think the LA Times even has a Southeast Asia correspondent now. And uh, all those first class tickets and so on were financed by the deluge of classified ads that made papers like the New York Times and the LA Times rich. And the classifieds have all migrated to the internet and a lot of display advertising is also moving increasingly to Google and Facebook, which offer a better targeted audience, frankly. Um, however, there are signs that some of the traditional model is, is coming back. People are finding ways, mainly through subscription. The New York Times actually appears now once again to be a money machine. The FT actually, which was one of the first papers to put ourselves behind a paywall after a deep sort of gulp, whether this was the right thing to do, it's worked. Uh, so I think that the traditional media, not all of them, not quite in the same numbers, uh, but some of them are making, making life pay again. So I guess if you went back to Bangkok, because I was there in 92, there would be 
fewer foreign correspondents there, certainly fewer staff foreign correspondents, but there still would be some. There are, there are traditional media that are still making it, uh, making it work. Um, but as hard press papers look for money to save, their eyes do fall increasingly on foreign bureaus. Uh, even if the correspondents no longer live in penthouses, uh, foreign bureaus are still expensive to run. And worse, the ability to count clicks on stories has demonstrated to publishers that foreign stories are often just not read very much. So why would you spend money supporting the most expensive part of the operation when you know that a cat video or Kim, or, um, Kim Kardashian story will attract more attention? So the decrease in the amount of foreign coverage that traditional news outlets are willing or able to afford it's, it's becoming a common problem across the Western world. And I was looking, Michael, I think a few years ago, you were making this point that Australia was more and more impacted by the world, but that the ABC had, at the time you were talking, just cut back its foreign coverage. But the picture is not all bleak. If you look, certainly, at the three main employers of my career, the BBC, The Economist, the FT, and we have the editor of The Guardian out there as well. It's also true of them. It's true that money can be tighter than it once was, but all these organizations continue to maintain formidable networks of foreign correspondents. And they know that reporting the world is a crucial part of their identities. And they'll do their utmost not to let that slip, and are, are doing that. And also, even as some of the older news organizations have cut back or disappeared, others are popping up in their places. So if I think of where the FT hires from now, you know, the, traditionally, the route would be somebody worked for Reuters or one of the news agencies, and then they'd move to a newspaper. Uh, but we hire people now from things that didn't exist a few years ago, things like Axios, BuzzFeed, etc. There are new forms of media coming up. And uh, globalization has also spawned a much greater appetite for international business news. So Bloomberg, which didn't exist when I started out, is now a huge global news organization, admittedly backed by a billionaire. Um, and while their bread and butter is business, they also cover politics. They have big foreign bureaus. And the shrinkage of the budgets of traditional news organizations also opens up opportunities for freelancers. And new technologies are making it easier to do foreign news without some of the kind of financial backing that you would have had to need in the past. So you no longer need a camera crew to film a report. You can do it on an iPhone. And of course, there's a plethora of simple ways of sending your story over, whether it's email, text, WhatsApp, whatever. This may seem hardly worth remarking on, but it's still, uh, you know, I'm making myself sound incredibly old, but it's still remarkable to me because I remember when I started reporting from abroad, filing was a real nightmare. One of the first things that you were taught as a trainee radio correspondent at the BBC in the 1980s was how to dismantle a hotel telephone so that you could attach crocodile crypts to the mouthpiece and then file through a microphone. And it was partly, without the sheer palaver of that, was one of the things that motivated me to move to print so that I didn't have to sp <laughs> spend my time sort of trying to fiddling around with bits of wire in hotel rooms. But even there, in print, things were still amazingly primitive. So I mentioned my job with the Sunday Correspondent in, in Washington in 1990. And filing by computer was just coming in. But in the three months that David Blundy and I worked together, we never actually managed to get the modem on our joint computer. We had one to work. So we had innumerable visits from some long forgotten company who would fiddle with it and say, no, it's still not working. Uh, so we, we ended up uh, just filing by literally dictating our copy down the phone to somebody in London with uh, predictably farcical results. You'd get the paper like <laughs> two days later and say, oh, my, you know, I didn't say that. But, uh, so yeah, it's, so it's it, the combination of technology um, uh, you know, and the, the financial problems of old media do provide an opening for today's freelance foreign correspondents. But there are also issues of ethics and safety involved. You know, the Financial Times, and I know, I'm sure at The Guardian as well, we know there are lots of brave young journalists who risk their lives trying to report from places like Ukraine. But we have to ask you know, whether we can morally encourage them to take those risks when they won't be able to take the safety precautions that we would insist on if they were one of our own correspondents. And social media and new technology affect not just the way that stories can be created and filed. More importantly, they affect the way that stories are consumed. Conventional newspapers like mine uh, 
are increasingly finding that their stories and reporting are being, not being followed by people who buy the paper or even come directly to the site, uh, but they, they get through social media. So if people read a column of mine, for example, and we can follow all these things with kind of disconcerting precision, you can see how far people have got into your article, never as far as you would have liked. Um, but uh, more than 50% of the readers who come across my pieces will have, it will have come to them via Twitter or Facebook. And that change of uh, patterns of consumption has changed the job in important ways. So the pressure's on to create stories that are easily shared, that have important keywords in the headline. When I started The Economist, the, you know, one of the great pleasures was trying to find a witty headline with a pun in it. That was the pride and joy of, of The Economist, but it doesn't really work online. What you want instead is something that attracts search engines. So in my world, the keywords, you've got to have Trump or Putin in the headline, and you know, people, people can find it. Unfortunately, knowing the popular words also means knowing the unpopular words, and they include things like Syria and Ethiopia, because knowing more about who your audience is and knowing what it wants inevitably affects the kinds of things that journalists report on, and perhaps more important, that editors commission. And the threat for foreign reporters is that the rise of the internet and social media increases or could increase the pace that foreign news gets marginalized. And now that editors can count every click, they can see uh, that, that maybe that very important foreign news story isn't really attracting the readers. So I know, for example, if I have on my conscience the fact that I have not written a column about the war in Ethiopia and Tigray, where according to you know, at least academic studies, literally hundreds of thousands of people may have died, uh, either directly in the fighting or through famine, far more than in Ukraine. But I also know that when I do write that column, uh, it will probably get relatively few readers. These things are a bit unpredictable, but generally you kind of have a sense of what will be read. By contrast, I know that if I put Donald Trump or Putin in the headline, I'm much more likely to get that uh, surge of readers. And in a normal business, that wouldn't be a dilemma. You give the customers more of what they want, and you take the unpopular items, stories about Ethiopia off the shelf. But our business is journalism, which also plays a vital role in the creation of a healthy democratic society. So it's not that simple. The media do play a civic role. We inform the public debate. And if we don't tell our readers and listeners what's going on in the world, we can hardly complain if they make ill-informed choices as voters or as citizens. And the fact is that Australia and Britain as countries, as democracies, cannot afford to ignore the outside world. In recent years, we've got involved in wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, and we're engaged in a proxy war in Ukraine. The injunction to keep reporting on foreign news, however, even if interest levels can be low, can sound a little bit like a school teacher insisting that you know, children must still be served their greens, even if they push them to the side of the plate. But there are more encouraging trends, and one of them is to do with this rise of the internet and social media, which has a positive side for those of us attempting to cover the world. Because while we may know that the general audience for foreign news can be relatively small, Social media also allows for the creation of uh, small niche audiences, which when you put them together actually become quite large. So while in you know, maybe a decade ago, a story on Sri Lanka that appeared in the FT might have got a few thousand readers in the FT, if that. Now it's likely to be shared via social media amongst a whole community so of Sri Lanka watchers who might be expatriate Sri Lankans, but also academics, business people, human rights organizations and the like, and you draw together a community and so, as I say, although I think normally I have a good sense of what, what will be listened to or watched, I also do this podcast, sometimes I'm surprised. So I did a, a podcast on Sudan, and I felt like a slight duty one. I mean, it's an interesting story, but I thought this won't get much of an audience. And actually, it was one of the most listened things, things we did. And why was that? Well, because there are a lot of Sudanese, a lot of Sudanese living outside the country who are hungry for coverage of... of, of uh, a country and a conflict that was not really being covered in the world. So when suddenly there was like a half hour program on it, it actually drew in an audience, although over the course of about a month, you know, it took a, it spread by word of mouth. So I'm aware I'm slightly contradicting myself saying, you know, there are these, uh, there's a limited appetite for foreign news, but I suspect what's happening is that if you're confining it to your country, your countrymen, that, that audience, it can be quite small for an obscure foreign story. But in a globalized world where now 
you know, the English language media is consumed all over the world through the internet, and you, you can build new s forms of audience. Social media allows you to find your readers and your readers to find you, and your audience can increasingly be global, and that's already changed the business model of many British newspapers, which is why the editor of The Guardian is out here in Australia, because they've built an audience here in Australia. And the rise of social media has also blurred the distinction between the consumers and the producers of news in interesting ways. So we were discussing at our table Twitter and whether it's worth it. But for me, it's very much worth it because there are certain niche issues that I follow, say the South China Sea, big issue out here, niche in Britain. And it's covered pretty sporadically in the British press until a couple of years ago, if I wanted to follow it, I'd have to remind myself to log on occasionally to the Straits Times or the South China Morning Post. Before that, I would have been going down to a newspaper library and you know, finding days old copies of the paper. Now I follow the Twitter feeds of fellow South China Sea watchers and every day I can see thoughts, articles and snippets of news posted by people who might be in Sydney or Singapore or Hanoi. And they're helping to improve my work and I hope they make it a lot easier and I hope occasionally you know, I'm helping to improve there. So you have this exchange of ideas with people all over the world. So I guess the story I've told is, is one of a foreign news business that has been transformed mainly by technology uh, over the course of my career. But um, today, the nature of the job has changed enormously. Technology has transformed. The audience has changed. But I think one thing about the nature of the job hasn't changed. There will always be a need and an appetite for world news. And traveling the world as a reporter will remain one of the most exciting and rewarding jobs in journalism, indeed, of any profession I can think of. And for all the furore about fake news, and that's a real subject, maybe Michael and I will talk about it right now, I do still believe that uh, proper, well-reported stories will ultimately find a bigger, bigger audience than uh, weak or false reporting churned out by those with sometimes malign motives. So we're gathered here tonight to celebrate the best in Australian journalism. And the best journalism is always worth celebrating, and I think we'll always find an audience. I certainly hope so. Thank you. Gideon, thank you for those remarks. Thank you for the yarns. Uh, at the beginning about um, the legendary foreign correspondents. I've learned something about you, which is that you only moved into print because you didn't want to attach crocodile crips, clips to a, f a phone receiver. So remind me not to ask you for help with any IT yeah, issues. Totally not. Um, your difficulty filing reminded me of a, an experience I had with a foreign correspondent a few years ago where he was interviewing me on the phone and I did hear the clink of ice in glasses <laughs> behind him and sort of chitter chatter. And I gave him this line I was very proud of, which was that the United States, this was in the Trump era, that China was being reckless and the United States was being feckless. And when it appeared in, in press, he'd turned it around and, and, and it was um, the United States being reckless and China being feckless. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, some, sometimes the problems with filing continue. Let me ask you about three or four, five questions, and then I want to give the audience an opportunity to ask you questions too. Um, first of all, um, I agree with you about the advantage, just thinking about the economics of the media business, I agree with you the, about the advantage that the English language bestows mm -hmm. on, on us, and, it, and that applies to think tanks too, that if you can write well, if you have distinctive argument and you, you can write elegantly, you can find a global audience regardless of whether you're writing in Sydney or London or Bangkok. Yeah. Um, the, the titles that you mentioned um, are all global brands in a way, BBC, FT, Guardian, Economist. Are you finding um, in the UK that the global brands are really sort of pulling away from the other, uh, the other titles in, in the UK? Because it, 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 seems to, it, it has always seemed to me that a, that a title like The Guardian or The New York Times has an ability to build a global brand, but there can only be so many global media brands. Are you finding that or? Well, I think that, I mean, that most papers have at least uh, thought about it and tried to do it. Um, and obviously, 
there's a big pots of money out there if, if you can make it make it work. Um, I know that, for example, you know we've been recently taken over by Nikkei, uh, the Japanese uh, news organization, and they definitely see more scope for expansion in America. It's a huge market, um, but it's also a crowded market. So, yeah, if you can make it work, it's it's hugely helpful. And the New York Times has done it in reverse, uh, and you can see. You know, they have a huge office now in London, whereas before, you know, when I would have started, it might have been four or five people. It's hundreds now. Mm. So everybody's sort of going across how, how many global brands we can support. I just don't know. I mean, you know, uh, one, one assumes there's a limit, but, but it's, it's hard to be, mm. be sure. Let me ask you about the Ukraine story and the media. Mm. Um, the, the Ukrainians have proved incredibly innovative yeah. on the battlefield, but also on the information battlefield. Um, and I, you know, you probably saw that shot of uh, President Zelensky at the liberation of, of her son the other day, and and there were three or four camera guys uh, moving around him, getting getting the, the best possible shots. I was telling Gideon today of an anecdote that that I had, which was that when we hosted President Zelensky, um, he quoted in his speech he quoted um, a lecture that Angela Merkel had given to the Lowy Institute in 2014. Merkel came out for the, the Brisbane G20 meeting after the, after the invasion of Crimea and gave a very tough speech on Russia. And Zelensky quoted this in the speech to me. And I was a bit surprised by that. And afterwards I asked my colleagues, did we send that to Kiev? And they said no. And I asked the Ukrainian ambassador, did you send it to Kiev? And he said no. And so somewhere in Kiev, with munitions falling around, raining down on them, there are people who have the time to be looking through the Lowy Institute website to find content that they can use in a speech that he gives to the Lowy Institute. I mean, this is a level of deafness and dexterity that you don't get from major world leaders, let alone from an embattled um, war leader. So what are your observations uh, about the, the the cleverness, the advantage that Ukraine has won for itself in the information war compared to Mr the bloated Mr. Putin at the end of his long time. Yeah, no, I think it's it's very interesting because in, if you think before the war, we were all in a slight funk in the West about how brilliantly the Russians were mm. doing at manipulating Western politics. I mean, you refer to the Russian intervention in the 2016 presidential election and we were thinking, you know, we're a bit kind of uh, being caught on the back foot here and they're corrupting our our political discourse and we don't know how to respond and so on. And actually, RT, although now banned, I didn't watch it that much, but it wasn't like, you know, Soviet style. They had very much adopted a lot of the mannerisms of the West. That's what made it quite effective, is it looked kind of familiar, but they would just introduce different narratives, so doubt, etc. So that we thought, actually, the Russians are good at this. And it turns out now that they are incredibly outclassed. Mm. Uh, and it's partly, you know, what, what, how, how I ended. I, I do, it may be sort of clutching at straws, but I sort of think that even though fake news and pumping out different narratives and falsities, it, it can get you a long way. But in the end, I think it, it's become apparent to people that a lot of what the Russians say are, is, are lies, you know, and um, they've lost a lot of their credibility throughout the course of this war. And as you said, the Ukrainians have been incredibly adept. Um, and Zelensky, as it turns out, was brilliantly um, cast, he's an actor, uh, mm-hmm. for this role. Um, and I remember, actually, just before, the weekend before the war broke out, there was the Munich Security Conference, and I knew something was up, because I was getting on the plane to Munich, and in front of me were the heads of the Australian and the British intelligence services. Mm-hmm. and. Um, and I was sort of making, kind of trying to make chit chat with this guy, Richard Moore, who runs our intelligence service. And I sort of said, to my embarrassment in retrospect, you know, what a time to have a comedian as your, your president, you know. And he said to me, well, it could be worse, Gideon. We could have a journalist. <laughs> and I, I thought at the time, actually, it was aimed at me. And then I thought, actually, our prime minister's a journalist. You know, was, was he making a comment about his, his own boss? Um, but anyway, uh, as it turned out, Zelensky's, uh, you know, ability to to act in the way that, say, Reagan's ability to be an actor and to mm. play the role, as well as his undoubted courage. Mm. I mean, huge courage. So uh, again, just at that Munich thing, I remember uh, 
people were saying to him, are you really going to go back to Ukraine? Because we know that it's about to be invaded. And he said, I, you know, I had my breakfast there and I had my dinner there. That was a good line. And, um, and you know, it could have been so different if he had done what uh, you know, Ashraf Ghani did in Kabul and fled. Mm. I think it might have been all over. Mm. So he is a brilliant actor, but there's an authenticity behind it, which mm. is very important. What about reporting the China story in, in an era where increasingly Western foreign correspondents are being locked out of China. I think it's still true, uh, but someone will correct me if I'm wrong, that there are no Australian foreign correspondents in China reporting for Australian news organisations, although there are some reporting for other news organisations. But in general, it's much tougher to stay there, to get a visa. If you're there, it's much harder to report. How does that affect your ability to reach analytical conclusions? Or how does it affect all of our ability to, to know what's happening? in that country. Yeah, it's not good. I mean, and, and obviously, as well as the, the political crackdown, there's the pandemic, you know, so China's essentially been closed for two years uh, and more. Uh, so I was actually there. The, my last visit was as the pandemic was was breaking out. Um, and uh, but since then, I haven't been able to be back. And although, of course, if you've got uh, contacts, you can stay in touch with by phone, by email, but it's not the same. Um, because I don't know about you, but I just remember more if I've been somewhere as opposed to read about it or, or had the conversation in person as opposed to, mm. you know, but via Zoom. Mm. And it's the unexpected things that you see on the street that, mm. I mean, that, that yeah, inform your coverage. So I, I do feel a bit frustrated that, you know, I can continue writing about it and hopefully say something intelligent, but I do think you lose something, definitely. And, you know, we were joking about being banned from Russia. We all, all seem to be banned from Russia. And, yeah, you know, you can say, rah, rah, you know, good for me. But actually, I regret it because I always found it interesting going to, to Moscow. Um, you had conversations that stayed with you and, and so on. Um, and so that, too, was getting a bit harder. But I just sort of, I sometimes think that I may end up, you know, have, we've been in this weird period where you could really travel the world and I could be, in the same year, be in Beijing, in Moscow, Delhi. Um, and now I wonder whether, you know, India's actually getting harder to get visas for. I mean, I think you will eventually, but they don't exactly make it a pleasure. Um, and so that the world kind of feels like it's closing up again. Mm. All right, who would like to ask Gideon a question? We've got about 10 minutes. Andrea, my colleague, has a microphone at the back. It's a room full of journalists, so I can't, I can't imagine that uh, the hands won't be up soon. Lenore Taylor was the first to have her hand up. If you could wait for the microphone if you're asking a question and keep your questions concise. Thank you. Yes, I will. Um, uh, it, it's obviously true that uh, foreign bureaus and reporting from the front line is an incredibly expensive undertaking. But I wonder if the observations about social media as a means of conveying complex international stories might it might be that those of us of a certain age, and I include myself in that in that category, uh, see it one way and see news in one way, whereas if you convey news in the way that people consuming it on social media want to consume it, it can be very successful. And I make that observation because I have a young journalist who is, excels at TikTok who uh, did a TikTok about the fall of Kabul that was viewed 4.3 million times yeah. and one on Tigray which you mentioned, which was viewed 1.3 million times. So my question is, you know, perhaps if you use social media in the way that consumers of social media want to consume it, you can actually convey complex international stories that way in a really successful way. Yeah, I think that's probably true. I mean, everybody has to adapt to new technologies. And in a sense, I'm lucky in that I, I'm, you know, the FT audience is, is an audience that's, I guess relatively old, still used to consuming its news by reading. But even I've noticed, like, I do a podcast, which is not the most sort of technologically sophisticated thing, <laughs> but I'd assumed, I sort of regarded it as like a little side thing that I did just to show I was willing, you know, and uh, that the column was, was the main thing. But I've noticed increasingly the number of people who say, I listen to your podcast, is at least as high as the people who listen, who read the column. Uh, so I, even in a kind of limited way, I can see that the way people consume news is changing. And uh, to state the obvious, that you know, younger people are, are more au fait with social media, so they'll be much better at uh, figuring out how to do it um, because it's just natural to them and they're the con- consumers of it. I mean, I've never 
Uh, I've never used TikTok, uh, but are you, th- are you think are you TikTok curious? I'm not actually, but uh, but on the other hand, Twitter, as I say, I, I, I use a lot. So you, know. you said in your speech that you still think Twitter is worth it. Yeah, definitely. Are you with every crazy tweet and uh, from Elon Musk and and all this sort of speculation about how it might change? Are you is that starting to affect your calculation there? Um. Well, you think about it. I mean, I'll see if there's a mass migration from Twitter or if you feel that in some way the medium has been corrupted or is being manipulated in ways that you don't like, Mm. uh, then, you know, we'll move, I guess. But for the moment, it is still very useful. And actually, because of the technological ineptitude that you picked up on, I actually failed to get a blue tick so, I, so, so he can't charge me. Um, so, um. Yes, uh, Angus and on the back table, and then Julia Holman on this table. Um, hi, Gideon. Angus Grigg from the ABC. Um, we hear a lot about in this part of the world that the Brits want to be part of the Asia Pacific. Do you think that's actually true? Depends which Brits you're talking about. I, I, I think you know most uh, Brits that hasn't occurred to. Um, but obviously, as they're seeking to find a rationale or uh, for Brexit, um, Global Britain was the slogan that the Tories used. And um, behind that, there was a sort of a, a, a kind of half-truth, which is that if you look at the, where the exp- economic expansion in the world has been in the last 30 years, where the dynamism is, where the geopolitics uh, is becoming more and more central. It is this part of the world. Um, now, I don't think that necessarily should lead you to the conclusion that you cut yourself off from your closest market. But nonetheless, I think as the people charged with trying to make sense of where Britain is in the world, you know, there's nothing wrong with the, the idea that we should try to beef up our presence here. As I say, I think we could have done it from within the EU. But, but now, um, now we're out, it becomes more urgent. And you see this application to join the CPTPP. We'll see how, how that goes. There is also, um, you know, AUKUS is the other very uh, kind of germane example of, of that. And I think um, that's, it's an interesting move by Britain. I mean, I think it's mainly an Australian US initiative, but Britain's attached itself to it. And I think it maybe reflects the way the Americans are thinking about the world, which is that rather than saying, you know, do we preoccupy ourselves with Asia or do we think about the Middle East or do we do Europe? And this whole idea of pivoting to Asia, the Americans had, I think their kind of latest iteration of their thinking is that you, you've really got to try to connect these theatres and that they are connected so that if, for example, Russia had rolled over Ukraine in a week, that would have had a very dramatic effect on geopolitics out here. It would have you know, changed the way China was seen, the way China saw its role. And that therefore, particularly if you're thinking as Biden is in terms of democracies, autocracies, that you want to try and connect the America's alliance system in Asia with its alliance system in Europe. And that's sort of what they're doing. And I think AUKUS was definitely a part of that. But as I said, I don't think it's, it's kind of filtered beyond the uh, sort of foreign policy level, except that in population terms, I think it's really, uh, it does matter, you know, that Britain has significant uh, populations with, you know, origins in South Asia, increasingly as well the Philippines, East Asia. And for them, it's a very natural connection. Uh, so, um, you know, to give you a personal anecdote, my wife works in the health service. All her colleagues are from the Philippines, and from India, and a lot of them voted for Brexit, not out of any particular anti-European sentiment, but just because to them it seemed obvious that this was the part of the world that they felt a connection to, not actually France or Italy. Let me ask you about Brexit. Um, things have not gone exactly to plan. Um, I think I'm right that that uh, opinion polls indicate that a majority of Brits now regret the decision to exit the European Union. Can you imagine what, what, what are the chances of Britain applying to rejoin the EU in the future? I wouldn't think uh, in the next decade, 
uh, I mean, things can change. Who knows? If you know, there's some global war or whatever, in 1940, didn't Churchill propose that Britain and France become a single country? So, you know, things can happen. But, uh, but I think that under the cur current circumstances, the, nobody really wants to go over that issue again. Uh, we've also made, you know, we've left the EU now, retracing those steps, ripping up the UK-Australia trade deal and all the others. Would, it would just be too much of a... Of a faff, you know, um, but I think that um, also politically, the Labour, I mean, Keir Starmer was a pretty committed Remainer, but he's even more committed to becoming Prime Minister. And I would imagine that he knows that at the moment, the Tories have done so badly, he's so far ahead in the polls, he's just got to sit tight and he'll kind of mm. should cruise in. But the one way he could really ignite the Tory party is by mm. saying, I'm going to rejoin the EU. Mm. And that would give enormous emotional momentum to the old leave camp so he's not going to do that mm. uh, so i think what they'll try and do instead is to rebuild ties with the europeans step by step you know issue by issue but even that's not going to be that as easy because the eu are very legalistic about these things and they don't want us to cherry pick and do a switzerland etc mm. so it's going to be hard julia Hi, Julia Holman from Radio National Breakfast on the ABC. Um, one of the most surprising stories this year was um, how Ukraine has withstood Russia's assault on their country. Um, and you referred to it um, earlier. We we had a night, you know, most of the world thought that Ukraine would roll over in a week and, sure. and we're months in and, and they're not going anywhere. Um, but Europe is about to get very, very cold and energy is going to become very, very expensive. There's a lot of support in the West now for Ukraine and opposition towards Russia, but I'm just wondering what a very cold winter might mean for the conflict and for Vladimir Putin. Well, I think it's, you're right. It's his... I don't know whether this is his last throw of the dice. He's probably got a couple more up his sleeve. But it's 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 something that he is really hoping will change the momentum. Um, and, um, yeah, inflation is high. And people are, I think it's 11% in Britain. And, uh, you know, talking to friends in Italy, the cost of living is the, the number one issue. You may even get rationing, actually, if things get really bad. Um, so the pressure will mount on public opinion. I think that the current, but I, I don't think it will lead to an immediate shift in policy. I think the current set of leaders are pretty committed to Ukraine, can see this gambit coming and are going to try to see it through and somehow manage the political tension. So it would have to be a, like a two-stage process. They would have to become so unpopular because of the cost of living crisis, that they were then replaced by a bunch of other politicians. You know, uh, uh, the French far right would have to do well, or Salvini would have to come up in the polls in Italy, or, or somebody in, in Britain would have to start making the case for rapprochement with Russia, maybe Nigel Farage, I don't know. Um, but I, I, so I think it'll take a while, even if things get quite tough. I wouldn't say it's impossible, but it's not gonna happen like overnight. Anyone else want to try to squeeze in a question? Yes, madam, if you could just wait for the microphone. Hi, Lee Tonkin from the ABC Online. Um, two very simple questions. What's the best foreign policy global affairs book you've read this year? And who is your must read every time they print something columnist. Yeah, those are, those are, they're not simple questions, actually. I'm now thinking, Jesus, what have I read this year? Um, so um, whose foreign policy book have I liked? I mean, I liked, um, I don't know whether it came out this year, but Anne Applebaum's book on the return of authoritarianism was, I thought, very good. She writes, she's got a very good way of kind of mixing in anecdote and analysis. I think she's Excellent. I thought Philip Short's massive biography of Putin is uh, is pretty good, um, and I think actually the the two really excellent books on U.S. politics just out now. I haven't I haven't actually read Maggie Harberman's book on Trump, but I'm really looking forward to reading it. Susan Glasser, who you mentioned, her and her husband Peter Baker have just written an excellent book on the first uh, Trump presidency, which is. Uh, you know, astonishing, even though one kind of knows the details, it, just reading them, it, it still makes you blink as to, to what actually happened. So I guess those uh, those would be the ones I'd, I'd think of right now. 
Um, as to who I read, I mean, I tend to, I mean, I read other columnists out of curiosity to see what they're up to, you know. Um, Jealousy as well? No, actually. I mean, I, the, ones, the, ones, the ones I feel jealous of, or not jealous of, the ones I really admire tend to be the ones doing something a bit different from me. Mm. Like, uh, like I could never do what Marina High does for The Guardian. She's brilliant, but, you know, I'm not in competition with her. I always enjoy reading her. Um, and, but I mainly read other particular foreign correspondents, you know, people who cover countries particularly well. Like I, right now, I mean, we were talking about the thinning out of China coverage. So The Economist have a brilliant guy in Beijing called... David Rennie, who does his Chagwan column, is like a must read for me. So they're particular people covering particular countries, I read, as much as columnists do. You mentioned Susan Glasser, and I had Susan on my podcast uh, the other week, and I asked oh, her. Oh, so did I. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> and and yeah. um, one of, and I asked her what would be the character of a, of a second Trump presidency if he were elected uh, president. And um, she said that a high White House official who served Trump said, gave her an arresting image, and that is of the the first Jurassic Park movie where the Velociraptor's claw comes around the door because the Velociraptor... They, the door is locked, but the Velociraptor has learned to open the door. <laughs> and she said that's what it would be. That's yeah. what it would be like. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask the last question um, because there was another book, uh, another brilliant book on um, international affairs published this year. You, you didn't mention The Age of the Strongman, um, and you wrote about these authoritarian figures emerging and defining our era. Um, but as the year's gone on, it hasn't gone that well necessarily for yeah. all of them. And we saw Trump's red wave sort of dash against the rocks and Putin um, looks uh, much weakened. I mean, could it possibly be a bad time to be a strong man? Yeah, you know, I actually feel more hopeful this week than I have for a long time because of, uh, I mean... The, the Trump uh, setback. I was, maybe, I don't know, I've become sort of congenitally gloomy. I actually went back over all my columns to see, you know, what my record was like. And I worked out that the ones that were wrong were always the optimistic ones. <laughs> it, was, it was the ones where I said Trump could win, right, we're going to vote for Brexit, correct. And when I say, oh, it's, it'll be all right, wrong, that's certainly been the case lately. But uh, I do think that this pretty what I call this strongman phenomenon, which is the rise of politicians both in democracies and in autocracies who are devotees of a very personalized style of government, have a cult of personality, the kind of thing that Xi Jinping is doing in China, but that in a different way Trump was doing in America, Bolsonaro in Brazil. It's not been a great year for them. I mean, if Putin had rolled over Ukraine in a week, I think he was actually the archetype for a lot of these people that really explicitly admired him. Then I think that that style of government would have really got a huge boost. But actually, you know, Joe Biden, who's meant to be for the sort of strongman style people, the epitome of a weak, what what a weak democracy produces, this old guy, you know, who's hemmed in by a Congress he doesn't even control, et cetera, et cetera, as opposed to the macho Putin. In fact, Biden's had a much better year than Putin, so that is good. Um, not all of these strong men have gone down to defeat. Orban did all right, won quite easily, but Bolsonaro lost and, interestingly, didn't challenge the elections. We all thought he'd do a Trump, but mm. he, he actually... Brazilian institutions proved to be really pretty robust. The next one I'd like to see lose is Erdogan in Turkey, and that could happen next year. She, on the other hand, has just dug himself in and may be there for life, but... I think it's becoming increasingly clear that he's not a very good governor of, of his country. Uh, the economy's in trouble, the private sector's in trouble, he's antagonized large numbers of his neighbors. Um, and I think that strongman style government is actually a very bad way, I mean, it sounds stating the obvious in a democratic country, but it is a bad way of running a country because it over-centralizes authority and somebody who and the longer they stay on, the more power crazy they become and the more they lose touch with reality. So um, eventually it's a system that's likely to fail. And, but I wondered it might be decades. Maybe we're in luck and it's beginning to, uh, to run its course even now. And I do think that the Trump thing is incredibly important because you could, you could point to you know Hungary, Brazil, but in the end, what sets the political tone in the world is still what happens in the United States. Mm. And if Trump 
were to come back, you know, forget about talking about the end of the age of the strongman, would, as Susan Glasser pointed out, it would be an even more dangerous mm. era. So a lot still rides on that. I'm not prepared to say it's over, he's finished. I don't think that. But I do think he's looking a lot weaker than he did a week ago. Mm, which is why the United States will probably be the biggest story in the next year. Yep. Ladies and gentlemen, I think you've had a sense today of why Gideon is such a fabulous columnist because of the quickness of his mind and the breadth of his knowledge uh, and also despite his disavowal in the introduction his his self-effacing humor um, so i really enjoyed your lecture gideon and i'd like everybody to join me in thanking gideon rackman <laughs>